Pre-Colonial Black Africa by Sheikh Anta Diop Copyright 1987 by Lawrence Hill and Company Translated from the French by Harold Selimson Preface Until now Brackets, 1960, date of the first edition, close brackets. The history of black Africa has always been written with dates as dry as laundry lists, and no one has almost ever tried to find the key that unlocks the door to the intelligence, the understanding of African society. Failing which, no researcher has ever succeeded in reviving the African past and bringing back to life in our minds before our very eyes, so to speak, while remaining strictly within the realm of science. Yet, the documents at our disposal allow us to do that practically without any break in continuity for a period of 2,000 years, at least insofar as West Africa is concerned. Therefore, it had become indispensable to unfreeze, in a manner of speaking, to defossilize that African history which was there at hand, lifeless, imprisoned in the documents. However, this work is not, properly speaking, a book of history, but it is an auxiliary tool indispensable to the historian. It indeed afforded him a scientific understanding of all the historical facts hitherto unexplained. In that sense, it is a study in African historical sociology. It permits us no longer to be surprised at the stagnation, or rather the relatively stable equilibrium of pre-colonial African societies. The analysis of their socio-political structures presented in it, allowing us to gauge the stabilizing factors in African society. One thereby understands the technical and other lags to be the result of a different kind of development based upon absolutely objective fundamental causes. Thus, there is no longer any reason for embarrassment. Once this awareness achieved, we can immediately and fully, in almost every slightest detail, relive all the aspects of African national life, the administrative, judicial, economic, and military organizations, that of labor, the technical level, the migrations and formations of peoples and nationalities, thus their ethnic genesis and consequently almost linguistic genesis, etc. Upon absorbing any such human experience, we sense deep within ourselves a true reinforcement of our feeling of cultural oneness. Pre-Colonial Black Africa Chapter 1 Analysis of the Concept of Caste It seems necessary at the outset to point out the specific features of the caste system. In order more clearly to bring out the difference in social structure which has always existed between Europe and Africa, the originality of the system resides in the fact that the dynamic elements of society whose discontent might have engendered revolution are really satisfied with their social condition and do not seek to change it. A man of so-called inferior caste would categorically refuse to enter a so-called superior one. In Africa, it is not rare for members of the lower caste to refuse to enter into conjugal relations with those of the higher caste, even though the reverse would seem more normal. Major Divisions Within the Caste System Let us proceed to a description of the internal structure of the caste system, before attempting an explanation of its origin. The present territory of Senegal will be used here as a model for study. Nevertheless, the conclusions which are drawn from it hold true for the whole of detribalized Sudanese Africa. In Senegal, society is divided into slaves and freemen, the latter being Gor, including both Ger and Nenyo. The Ger comprise the nobles and all freemen with no manual profession other than agriculture considered a sacred activity. The Nenyo comprise all artisans, shoemakers, blacksmiths, 
goldsmiths, etc. These are hereditary professions. The jam or slaves include the jam burr, who are slaves of the king, the jam neg nene, slaves of one's mother, and the jam neg bay, slaves of one's father. The gear formed the superior caste, but and herein lay the real originality of the system. Unlike the attitude of the nobles toward the bourgeoisie, the lords toward the serfs, or the Brahmins toward the other Indian caste, the gear could not materially exploit the lower caste without losing face in the eyes of others, as well as their own. On the contrary, they were obliged to assist lower caste members in every way possible, even if less wealthy, they had to give to a man of lower caste if so requested. In exchange, the latter had to allow them social precedence. The specific feature of this system therefore consisted in the fact that the manual laborer, instead of being deprived of the fruits of his labor, as was the artisan or the serf of the Middle Ages, could, on the contrary, add to it wealth given him by the Lord. Consequently, if a revolution were to occur, it would be initiated from above and not from below. But that is not all, as we shall see. Members of all castes, including slaves, were closely associated to power, as de facto ministers, which resulted in constitutional monarchies governed by councils of ministers, made up of authentic representatives of all the people. We can understand from this why there were no revolutions in Africa against the regime, but only against those who administered it poorly, i.e. unworthy princes. In addition, there were of course also palace revolutions. For every caste, advantages and disadvantages. Deprivations of rights and compensations balanced out. So it is outside of consciousness and material progress and external influences that the historical motives must be sought. Taking into account their isolation, which however must not be exaggerated, it can be understood why Africa's societies remained relatively stable. Conditions of the Slaves the only group that would have an interest in overthrowing the social order were the slaves of the father's household. In alliance with the Badolo, those without power, socially speaking the poor peasants, indeed it is clear from what preceded that the status of the artisans was an enviable one. Their consciences could in no way be bearers of the seeds of revolution being the principal beneficiaries of the monarchical regime. They defend it up to this day, or regret its passing. By definition, all slaves should make up the revolutionary class. One can easily imagine the state of mind of a warrior or any freeman whose condition through defeat in war radically changes from one day to the next, as he becomes a slave, as in classical antiquity prisoners of war were automatically subject to being sold. Persons of rank might be ransomed by their families. Who would give in exchange a certain number of slaves? In principle, one could have a nephew serve as a substitute, a man's sister's son, and this matriarchal regime would be given by his uncle in ransom. Whence the two Wolof expressions Na Jay, may he sell, i.e., the uncle, and Jarbat, he who can buy back, i.e., the nephew. But this is where the slave comes in. In this aristocratic regime, the nobles form the cavalry of the army, the chivalry. The infantry was composed of slaves former prisoners of war taken from outside the national territory. 
The slaves of the king formed the greater part of his forces, and in consequence, their condition was greatly improved. They were now slaves in name only. The rancor in their hearts had been lightened by the favors they received. They shared in the booty after an expedition under protection of the king. During periods of social unrest, they could even indulge in discreet pillage within the national territory against the poor peasants, the Badolo, but never against the artisans who were always able to gain restitution of their confiscated goods. The regime, the social moors obtaining, allowed the artisans to go directly to the prince without fear and complain to him. The slaves were commanded by one of their own, the infantry general, who was a pseudo prince in that he might rule over a fife inhabited by freemen. Such was the case in the monarchy of Kayor, Senegal, of the Jaraf Bunt Kur. The representatives of the slaves within the government and commander-in-chief of the army. His power and authority were so great that the day of his betrayal brought an end to the kingdom of Kaior. We will return to this matter under the heading of political constitutions. However, the ennobling of a slave, even by the king, was impossible in Africa. In contrast to the customs of European courts, Birth appeared to be something intrinsic in the eyes of this society, and even the king would have been ill-advised to ennoble anyone at all, even a freeman. The slaves of the king, by force of circumstance, thus became an element favorable to the preservation of the regime. They were a conservative element. The slave of the mother's household was the captive of our mother as opposed to the slave of our father. He might have been bought on the open market, come from an inheritance, or be a gift. Once established in the family, he became almost an integral part of it. He was the loyal, domestic, respected, feared, and consulted by the children. Due to the matriarchal and polygamous regime, we feel him closer to us. Because he belongs to our mother, than the slave of the father, who is at an equal distance, socially speaking, from all the children of the same father and different mothers. As can easily be seen, the slave of the father would become the scapegoat for the society. Therefore, the slave of the mother could not be a revolutionary. The slave of the father's household, by contrast, considering his anonymous position, our father is everyone, so to speak, while our mother is truly our own, will be of no interest to anyone and have no special protection in society. He may de be deposed of without compensation. However, his condition is not comparable to that of the plebeian of ancient Rome, the Theat of Athens, or the Sudra of India. The condition of the Sudra was based on a religious significance. Contact with them was considered impure. Society had been structured without taking their existence into account. They could not even live in the cities, nor participate in religious ceremonies, nor at the outset have a religion of their own. We will return to this matter later. However, the alienation of the slaves of the father's household in Africa was great enough on the moral and material plane that their minds could be truly revolutionary. But for reasons connected to the pre-industrial nature of Africa, such as the dispersion of the population into villages, for example, they could not affect the revolution. We must also add that they were really intruders in a hostile society which watched them day and night and would never have allowed them time to plot a rebellion with their peers. It made it even less possible for them to acquire economic position and morale and intellectual education. In short, any social strength comparable to that of the bourgeoisie of the West when it overthrew the aristocracy. Slaves of this category might apparently at best have joined forces with the poor peasants, those by dolo, without power 
whose labor actually sustained the nation more than that of the artisans. The Badolo The Badolo, by definition, were not nenos, but gares of modest means, doomed to the cultivation of the earth, as gares belonging to the same level as the prince. The latter found nothing dishonorable or debasing in pillaging their goods, however small they might be, since a well-to-do ger, finding himself in privileged circumstances, might marry a princess, although of secondary rank to be sure, the badolo, being a ger without means, would have to carry the fiscal burdens of society. Indeed, according to the African concept of honor, it was not those of inferior rank who were to be exploited, should occasion arise, but rather social equals, particularly where the latter did not have the material power to defend themselves, which was the case of the Badolo. For reasons of this kind, the possessions of the artisan were spared. In such pre-industrial agricultural regimes, it is true, Everyone was involved in the cultivation of the soil, including the king, who, according to Caliard, was the foremost farmer of St. Nar. But on closer examination, it was the Badolo more than the artisans who fed the population and constituted the majority of the laboring class. Out of caste prejudice, however, as can easily be deduced from the preceding, they could not lower themselves so far as to form an alliance with the malcontent slaves, especially since the latter were disorganized and had no chance of success. If such an alliance had come to be in the course of African history, it would have led to a peasant's and slave's revolt, a Jacques Courre, of the kind Egypt experienced toward the close of the Middle Kingdom or the sort common to Western history ever since the Middle Ages, none of which was ever successful. It would have been a revolt and not a revolution, such as the French bourgeois revolution. But we shall see that in pre-colonial Africa, the length of the periods of prosperity had nothing in common with that of the periods of dearth, which were rather exceptional and ephemeral and that the general abundance of economic resources and the extraordinary legendary wealth of the continent in fact foreclosed the birth and growth of any revolutionary spirit in African consciousness. Genesis of the Caste System The caste system arose from a division of labor but under an advanced political regime which was monarchic, for one never finds castes where there are no nobles. However, it is very probable that the specialization of labor, which led to the hereditary transmission of trades in the caste system on a family or individual scale, evolved out of the clanic organization. If one looks at the totemic names all those who practice the same trade, all those who belong to the same caste, are of the same totemic clan. For example, in spite of all the exogamic marriages that may have taken place after detribalization, all Mars are shoemakers, belonging to the same clan and have the same totem. No matter how territorially separated they may have become, Thus, two mares who meet for the first time understand that they have a common clan origin. Be that as it may, at the time of the empires of Ghana and Mali, as evidenced by the testimony of Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Battuta, and the Tariq es Sudan, detribalization had already taken place throughout these great empires. At the time of the conquest of northern Africa by the Muslims, 
some merchants penetrated into the western part of the land of the blacks and found among them no king more powerful than the king of Ghana. His states extended westward to the shores of the Atlantic Ocean. Ghana, the capital of this strong, populous nation, was made up of two towns separated by the Niger River and formed one of the greatest and best populated cities of the world. The author of the book of Roger, Al-Bakri, makes special mention of it, as does the author of Roads and Kingdoms. One may suppose that in a city such as Ghana, which in the 10th century was already one of the largest in the world, tribal organization had completely given way to the demands of urban life. At any rate, transmission of the individual name and inheritance, as it was practiced in the empire of Mali, according to Ibn Battuta, leaves us in no doubt about the disappearance of the tribal system in this region in 1352. They, the blacks, are named after their maternal uncles and not after their fathers. It is not the sons who inherit from their fathers, but the nephews, the sons of the father's sister. I have never met with this last custom anywhere else except among the infidels of Malabar in India. One fact that has not been sufficiently stressed is that the individual had a first or given name, but not a family name, before the dislocation of the clan. Theretofore, a person bore the name of the clan, but only collectively, so that when asked his name, he would always reply that he was of the clan of the Ba Pendi, Ba Oule, Ba Congo, etc. He was a member of the community and only the dis dispersal of it could afford him individual existence as well as a family name which remained then as a sort of recall the name of the clan this is therefore one of the reasons we always speak of totemic names and according to the passage cited from Ibn Battuta we see that the individual already bore a personal family name the name of his mother due to the matriarchal system. This is confirmed by all the family names of important personages transmitted to us by the Tariq as Sudan. This work was written by a learned black of the 16th century AD, but relates events, the most ancient of which date back to the first centuries after the birth of Christ. The same could be said of the Tariq el Fetak, written in the same period by another black from Timbuktu, Kati. The stability of the caste system was assured by the hereditary transmission of social occupations, which corresponded in a certain measure to a monopoly disguised by a religious prohibition in order to eliminate professional competition. Indeed, religious significance was attached to the inheritance of the trade. According to the current beliefs, a subject from outside a trade, even if he acquired all the skill and science of a calling, which was not that of his family, would not be able to practice it efficiently in the mystical sense, because it was not his ancestors who concluded the initial contract with the spirit who had originally taught it to humanity. Due to an understandable tendency toward generalization, even scientific specializations to which no notions of caste are attached, e.g. eye or ear medicine, etc., are dominated by this idea. Up to this point in Africa, in the villages, a given family was specialized in the treatment of one particular part of the body only. It is interesting to note that this was also the case in ancient Egypt, where, in all probability, there was originally a caste system. Caste in Egypt 
there are seven classes of Egyptians, and of these some are called priests, others warriors, others herdsmen, others swine herds, others trademen, others interpreters, and lastly pilots. Such are the classes of Egyptians. They take their names from the employments they exercise. Their warriors are called Kalasiris or Hermodabes, and they are of the following districts, for all Egypt is divided into districts. The following are the districts of the Hermodabes, Busiris, Sais, Chemis, Papremis, the island called Prosipites, and the half of Natho. From these districts are the Hermotubbies, being in number, when they are most numerous, a hundred and sixty thousand. None of these learn any mechanical art, but apply themselves wholly to military affairs. These next are the districts of the Calasiris, Thebes, Bubastis, Actis, Tanis, Mendes, Sabenes, Athribis, Farbathis, Dumuis, Anupis, Anisis, Mysephorus. This district is situated in an island opposite the city Bubastis. These are the districts of the Colosseries, being in number when they are most numerous, two hundred and fifty thousand men. Neither are these allowed to practice any art, but they devote themselves to military pursuits alone, the son succeeding to his father. The swineherd caste alone was considered impure in Egypt because of the prevailing religious notion concerning pork. The Egyptians considered the pig to be an impure beast, and therefore... If a man in passing by a pig should touch him only with his garments, he forthwith goes to the river and plunges in, and in the next place swine herds, although native Egyptians, are the only men who are not allowed to enter any of their temples. Neither will any man give his daughter in marriage to one of them, nor take a wife from among them, but the swine herds intermarry among themselves. The Egyptians therefore do not think it right to sacrifice swine to any other deities, but to the moon and Bacchus they do sacrifice them. The art of medicine is thus divided among them. Each physician applies himself to one disease only and not more. All places abound in physicians. Some physicians are for the eyes, others for the head, others for the teeth others for the parts about the belly, and others for internal disorders. One might believe that in Egypt, as well, clanic division corresponded, at least to some extent, with the division of labor, on the word of Herodotus. It is difficult to deny the totemic significance of the nomes, districts, with their local flags they were the first geographical districts occupied by the totemic clans that progressively fused to give birth to the Egyptian nation. But even in the low period, when these territorial divisions no longer had any more than an administrative significance, there remained enough of the effects of the totemic past so that one cannot doubt its existence. Be that as it may, as evidenced, by the preceding, there was a dual bond, religious and economic, which confined each individual within his caste, except in the caste of the slave who, not being a native, in reality belonged to a traditional lay category. Society had been conceived without taking his existence into account. He had been forcibly introduced into it, an intruder 
A place was made for him somehow or other without its assuming any religious significance. He was forcibly subjugated for nothing more nor less than economic and material reasons. No metaphysical concept later arose to justify his condition as if to ease the consciences of the citizens. We shall see that it was otherwise in India for the pariahs and for the plebeians of antiquity where the religious system stipulated the impurity of these inferior classes. In Africa, slaves belong to a hierarchy. The social condition of the masters carried over to the slaves. Slaves of a nobleman were superior to those of a simple freeman and gave to the latter, and the latter in turn. If the slave of a gar would give to the slave of an artisan, an artisan might own slaves, since he was a gore. Nobles and clergy, traditional or Islamic, following the Almoravidi movement of the 10th century, belong to the same caste and marry among themselves. But these nobles have the peculiarity of not being landowners, in the sense we give to this term as applied to the Middle Ages in the Western world. The land in Africa does not belong to the conquerors. The mind of the nobles is not concerned with the possession of great landed estates to be cultivated by serfs bound to the soil. In this sense, there was no feudal system in Africa. This question will be treated later. In Africa, the nobility never acquired this keen sense of ownership of the land. Alongside the conqueror, the king, there is in each village a poor old man in tatters, but respected and spared, whom the spirit of the earth is considered to have entrusted with the land. Earth is a divinity. It would be sacrilege actually to appropriate any part of it. It only lends itself to our agricultural activity in order to make human life possible. Even during the Islamic period, i.e. up to the present day, this religious concept obscurely influences the consciousness of all Africans, and it has contributed historically towards stopping or restraining tendencies to form a feudal system. The concept of privately owned land developed only among the Libu of the Cape Verde Peninsula as a result of the development of the great port of Dakar after European penetration. Plots of land there were until very recently more valuable than anywhere else in what was French West Africa. Genesis of the caste system in India. One cannot ignore the case of India when considering the general question of caste. The notion of caste is so special in that part of the world that a study which did not take it into account would be lacking in consistency and demonstrative vigor as well as generality. According to Lenormand, this type of social organization was totally alien to the Aryans and Semites. Wherever we find it, in Egypt, Babylon, Africa, or the Kingdom of Malabar in India, we can be sure it is due to a southern Kushite influence. This system is essentially Kushite. Wherever it is found, it is not difficult to establish that it stems originally from this race of people. We have seen it flourish in Babylon. The Aryas of India who adopted it have borrowed it from the peoples of Kush who preceded them in the Indus and Ganges basins. While this appears to have been the origin of the caste system in India, one can see the transformations that the Aryan invasions occasioned in it. It has often been maintained without production of any conclusive historical documents 
that it was the Aryans themselves who created the caste system after having subjugated the black aboriginal Dravidian populace. Had this been the case, the criterion of color should have been at its foundation. There should have been at most three castes, whites, blacks, and the gamut of crossbreeds. However, this is not the case, and in India, also, the caste effectively correspond to a division of labor without any ethnic connotations. Strabo, in his geography, citing a more ancient author, Magasthenes, reports that there existed in India seven castes corresponding to certain well-defined social functions, Brahmins, philosophers, Kshatris, warriors, farmers, agents of the king, or Ipori, who crisscrossed the country to inform the king of what was going on, workers and artisans, counselors and couriers, and shepherds and hunters. Originally, the number of castes was smaller, only four, according to the laws of Manu, also corresponding to a division of labor, excluding any idea of ethnic differentiation, since a Dravidian can just as well be a Brahmin. But in order to protect this universe, he, the most resplendent one, assigned separate duties and occupation to those who sprang from his mouth, arms, thighs, and feet. 88. To Brahmanis he assigned teaching and studying the Veda, sacrificing for their own benefit and for others, giving and accepting of alms. Verse 89, the Kshatira he commanded to protect the people, to bestow gifts, to offer sacrifices, to study the Veda, and to abstain from attaching himself to sensual pleasures. Verse 90, the Vaisa to tend cattle, to bestow gifts, to offer sacrifices, to study the Veda, to trade, to lend money, and to cultivate land. 91. One occupation, only the Lord prescribed to Sudra, to serve meekly even those other three castes. Giving a divine character to property is an Aryan custom. In Rome, Greece, and in India, it led to the isolation from society of an entire category of individuals who had no family, had neither earth nor home, and no right of ownership. They would everywhere constitute the class of the wretched, able to acquire wealth only after the advent of money. Profane wealth, which had not been foreseen by the traditional and sacred laws regulating ownership that were made up by the ancestors of the Aryans. It was through its concern with the ownership of material goods that the Aryan spirit or genius impressed its mold upon the caste system. In the laws of Manu, one can follow a meticulous description of the objects that might be possessed by such and such a class, and, above all, those objects, the possession of which was forbidden to the lowest class and its crossbreeds. This consciousness of material interest, this exclusivism in the domain of possession, were the ideas added by the Aryans to the caste system which at first should not have contained them in India. It would never contain them in Africa. Here it is necessary to recall all the differences between the African slave on the one hand and the plebeian or sudra on the other. The Aryans meant to effect an economic classification of society in India as well as in Rome and Greece and not an ethnic separation. Verse 51 
But the dwellings of Candalus and Svavapagas shall be outside the village. They must be made a papratris, and their wealth shall be dogs and donkeys. 52. Their dress shall be garments of the dead. They shall eat their food from broken dishes. Black iron shall be their ornaments. And they must always wander from place to place. 53. A man who fulfills a religious duty shall not seek intercourse with them. Their transactions shall be among themselves and their marriages with their equals. 54. Their food shall be given to them by others. Then an Aryan giver, and a broken dish, at night, they shall not walk about in villages and towns. 55. By day, they may go about for the purpose of their work, distinguished by marks at the king's command, and they shall carry out the corpses of persons who have no relatives. That is a settled rule. 56. By the king's order, they shall always execute the criminals in accordance with the law, and they shall take for themselves the clothes, the beds, and the ornaments of such criminals. 57. A man of impure origin, who belongs not to any caste, Rana, but whose character is not known, who, though not an Aryan, has the appearance of an iron, one may discover by his acts. This last paragraph reveals that the untouchables of India, no more than the plebeians of Rome in principle, belong to a race different from that of the lords. Indeed, the criteria that allowed one to distinguish them were of a moral or material nature, not an ethnic one. The text further elaborates that it is in the behavior of an individual that one can discern the tendencies unworthy of an Aryan. He inherits from parents of a base class. In the next chapter we will study the conditions which led to the formation of this class, all of them social. We must stress that this class was totally absent from the unaltered southern systems in which religious prohibitions might isolate a social category e.g. the swine herds of Egypt yet not affected in its material interest to the point expressed in the preceding text that is one of the fundamental differences between the African and Aryan conceptions the swine herds of Egypt could absolutely acquire wealth in the same manner as others they were not forbidden the possession of any goods, but since they raised an animal to which religious prejudices were attached, these prejudices rebounded onto their own condition, and isolated them on a cultural plane, while leaving intact all their material interest. All of the traditional prohibitions of the rest of black Africa were of the same nature and never affected material goods. On the contrary, we can unquestionably affirm that in every such instance the possibilities of material gain on the part of subjects of the category concerned were increased by a kind of sentiment or eminent justice, a kind of compensatory spirit inherent in the society, for not only can they retain all their belongings, but they can increase their possessions by asking for some of others. For those material considerations, the laws of Manu tolerated a certain permeability of the caste system. They indeed provided for the case in which members of a superior class could no longer assure their existence solely by the means that religion recognized as legit legitimately theirs. In such a case, they provided a whole series of adaptations and accommodations. Verse 83. But a Brahmana or a Kshatira, living by a various mode of subsistence, shall carefully avoid the pursuit of agriculture, which
which causes injury to many beings and depends on others. 84. Some declare that agriculture is something excellent, but that means of subsistence is blamed by the virtuous, for the wooden implement with iron point injures the earth and the beings living in the earth. In the domain of marriage, the permeability of the caste system existed, but it was unilateral. Verse 12 for the first marriage of twice-born men, wives of equal caste are recommended. But for those who through desire proceed to marry again, the following females, chosen according to the direct order of the caste, are most approved. It is declared that a Sudra woman alone can be the wife of a Sudra. She and one of his own caste, the wives of a Vaisa, those two and one of his own caste, the wives of a Shatira, those three and one of his own caste, the wives of a Brahmana. The study of the caste system in India holds a wealth of lessons. It allows one to judge the relative importance of racial, economic, and ideological factors. One can see that the Aryan race created Western materialistic and industrial technological civilization wherever the historical and economic circumstances were ripe. It is these factors which must be considered determinate and not a peculiar set of mind in which the Aryans alone were privileged participants, conferring on them intellectual superiority over all others. Indeed, since it was a branch of this race that actually settled in Iran and India, adopting the social superstructure of the southern peoples while adapting it, if the racial set of mind were all that counted, one might ask, why then did it not create a civilization of the western type in their countries? Economic conditions aside, the caste system of social organization assures greater permanence and stability in society than does a system of classes created by the Aryans in Rome and in Greece, the study of which we will now begin. End of chapter 1